Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime. Unsolved mysteries. Missing people. Urban legends. And strange places. If you'd like to support this show and get a bunch of extra Paradise After Dark content, plus early and ad-free episodes on all of our Palm Hawk Media shows, go ahead and sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Palmahawk Media. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K Media. And also be sure to check out our website at paradiseafterdark.com. On the website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived ones, our mailing list, merch store, links to our social medias, and of course, our Patreon. And feel free to uh, swing by there and throw a few coins in the tip jar we have there. A little virtual tip jar. And if you want to throw some coins at us, like I said, we'll be happy to shout your name out on the show. So, Lauren... There is one thing I kind of want to discuss. Okay. The case that we've got tonight is one of the things that you kind of hope for in a case that could go either way. I mean, it's been deemed as a homicide, not a homicide. I mean, there's a lot of things going on with this case, and it kind of just gets swept under the rug until something big happens in the media, and then all of a sudden, this case gets opened back up. And that's what you want. It, it, that's what we, why we podcast is to help shed some light on some of those older cases or little cases that are kind of hidden, you know, that people don't know about. Then all of a sudden, you know, you start hearing the name, people are talking, there's social media posts and there's tweets. And the next thing you know, everyone's looking into this case and they start asking questions. Right. That yep. creates heat. So tonight we have a case that sort of had a little bit of a, a little bit of fire lit underneath it because of a really huge case. So. You want to kind of start us off? Well, we are going to be talking about the death of Stephen Smith. Now, if you haven't heard that name... Then move out of the rock you're living under. I'm sure that once we get going, you're going to realize who we're talking about. Because his case came about... Or not not his case. His death was actually in 2015. But it came back up during all of the Murdaugh debacles. Now, if you don't know who the Murdoughs are, then you're definitely under a rock. You say Murdoch, I say Murdoch. Anyway, Stephen Smith, a 19-year-old nursing student from Hampton, South Carolina, was found dead in the middle of Sandy Run Road, a dark country road, in the early morning hours of July 8, 2015. His car was discovered three miles away with the gas cap off. Authorities initially thought that Stephen had been shot but realized his injury was actually a deep gash in his head, not a gunshot wound. It was actually a 7.25-inch gaping hole on the right side of his forehead and no other major injuries aside from a dislocated shoulder and some cuts on his left hand. Authorities quickly ruled Stephen's death a hit and run, but many people, especially Stephen's mother, Sandy Smith, don't believe that. His family publicly speculated that it was a homicide and a hate crime involving his sexuality. Stephen was openly gay. And this is sort of backcountry, South Carolina area. I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying it's probably not an easy place to be an openly gay man. So Sandy and I both believe that this was a murder. Smith family attorney Mike Hemlip told People Magazine in 2022, whoever did this to Stephen should go to prison. But despite who says what, the how and why of Stephen's death that night remains a mystery. Well, before we get too far along here, let's go ahead and just talk a little bit about Stephen Smith. He was born January 29, 1996 in Lexington County, South Carolina to Fred Joel Smith and Sandy Smith. He was a 2014 graduate of Wade Hampton High School. And at the time of his death, he was attending OC Tech of Orangeburg, studying to become a registered nurse. He then planned to go on to become a doctor. Pretty big aspirations for this young man. Now, Stephen was described by family and friends as one who was not afraid to be himself. As Lauren said earlier, he was openly gay. 
sadly, this was 2015, and here we, I know I know that wasn't it doesn't seem like so long ago, but we have progressed significantly. Oh yes, but this is small town USA, right? And that that obviously was a problem, but for him it wasn't. He was he was who he was. I always admired how he was himself, unapologetic, Olivia Boyles, one of Stevens' high school friends, told the Greenville News in 2021. He gave me the encouragement to come out my 10th grade year. It could have been me who was killed. It could be the next person like us. Hemlep, the family's attorney, described Stephen as a fallen warrior for LGBTQ youth and a leader for gay teens throughout Hampton County to come out. Imagine what kind of doctor he could have been for gay kids, but he was not because someone bashed his head in, he said. The time for being sad is over. I'm no longer sad. I'm mad. And I want more. It's time to get angry. It's time to get answers. It's time to get solutions. We don't honor Stephen by being sad. The way to honor Stephen is to get mad, Hemlep told the Greenville News in 2021. Well, thanks to reporter Mandy Matney of Fitz News, we do have a pretty detailed timeline of what happened when Stephen's body was found. So follow me closely here. and. South Carolina, really, just side note, they should be the state of acronyms. Hmm. I mean, there's so many acronyms. Anyway, just follow along. So the 911 call came in at 3.57 a.m. on July 8, 2015. The caller reported a man laying in the middle of Sandy Run Road. Camp the County 911, where's your emergency? Hello, uh I just going down the wrong Crockettville Road. Mm-hmm. I see somebody laying out. What road are you? What's the name of the highway that you're on? Uh, I know it's Crockettville Road. Uh, you just know it's Crockettville Road. Yeah. Um, hold on, just a second. And which way are you headed? Okay. Uh, the back way to go. Uh, are you going to Fort Preston? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay, just, you're on that road just before you get into Crockettville? Turn to Crockettville and make that right. Okay. Come to Crockettville and take a right. Wait, take a, take a left. Where are you going? 601? Uh-huh. Bamberg? Uh-huh. If, yeah. I'm, if I'm going toward Bamberg, I'm going to take a left onto that road? Yeah, like you're going to, uh, I see the road called 14. You can go to Sandy Run, but... But you're not on Sandy Run Road? Yeah, I think it is. This, this, uh, this is you can the Sandy Road, go straight on out. Okay. Uh, and is it in the road or on the side of the road? It's in the road. Oh, in the road? Yeah. Uh-uh. All right. So what's your name and call that number? Uh, My name is Ryan Capers. Okay. All right, Mr. Capers. Can I get a phone number for you? Uh, I don't know the number off the office of your phone, but you can call this number back. I was okay. going to work. Okay, but this is a good number to reach you back at. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll get an officer headed out that way to see what's going on. Okay. So he's uh, leaving the road. I ain't, uh, I ain't moving or nothing like that. But um, somebody's going to hit him. It's dark. Uh-huh. Somebody's going to hit him. All right. We'll get an officer headed out that way. Okay. All right, sir. All right. So at 4.07 a.m., Michael Bridges of the Hampton County Sheriff's Office that's HCSO, acronym number one, responds to the scene, although there are conflicting reports about what time he arrived. At 5.15 a.m., J.L. Booker of the South Carolina Highway Patrol, SCHP, was notified by Lieutenant Bruce Brock, also of SCHP, of the incident. At 5.37 a.m., Sergeant Moore of SCHP gets a call from Corporal M.D. Allen also of SCHP, telling him about a possible hit and run on Sandy Run Road. Allen tells Duncan that the only injuries to the victim were around the head area. At 6 a.m., Duncan, on the way to the scene, calls Booker, said he was told it appeared to be a homicide, and that the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, that's SLED or SLED, was taking over. Booker says he was, quote, advised there was a possible gunshot wound to the victim's head. And then at 6.08 a.m., Moore is advised by Allen that the Multidisciplinary Accident Investigation Team, that's M-A-I-T, mate, is en route and that Allen is almost at the scene. Moore leaves his home and heads to Sandy Run Road. Allen informs Moore that it is a homicide, not a hit and run. 
Moore tells him to make sure that the coroner and the HCSO are also ruling it a homicide. 6.12 a.m., SLED crime scene was requested by Chief Deputy Bill Gerald of the HCSO to assist in the investigation of a possible homicide in Hampton County. At 6.25 a.m., Moore arrives at the scene and speaks with Hampton County Coroner Ernie Washington, who tells him it is a homicide. Washington points to the wound on Smith's head and calls it a gunshot wound, showing Moore the, quote, entry point. Now, Hampton County Deputy Coroner Kelly Green showed more photos of the body and pointed to an entry point on Smith's head and also to a defensive wound on Smith's hand. Moore asked Green if they were sure it was a homicide, and their response was yes. Moore advises Mate that they are no longer needed. Moore then walked the scene and saw no evidence of any car parts or pieces and then had all units clear the scene. Remember this detail. No car parts or pieces. No skid marks either. No evidence that is usually found in a normal hit-and-run case. At 8.25 a.m., Talon and Burke arrive at the scene. Talon notes that, quote, an EMS worker stated that a projectile wound was located on the victim's head and that the coroner moved the victim prior to sled crime scene arrival. Upon entering the scene, agents observed that the scene was secured by HCSO personnel and yellow barrier tape, the sled agent wrote. The victim was covered with a sheet. A hole in the skull was located above the victim's right eye. It was still unclear at this time if this hole was caused by a projectile. The victim's right arm was covered in blood and agents were unable to see any injuries. Sled agents noted minor injuries to the victim's left arm, left hand, and head. They searched the area for cartridge cases. The victim's hands were bagged. The coroner searches through the victim's clothing and located a vehicle key in the victim's front left pocket. The keys turned over to HCSO personnel. No other evidence was located at the scene, the sled agent wrote in their report. Prior to leaving the scene, agents discussed their findings and completed a walkthrough with investigator Perry Singleton and Chief Billy Gerald, the sled report said. At 9.18 a.m., SLED agents released the scene to HCSO personnel and left. At 9.20 a.m., SLED agents then responded approximately three miles away to the victim's vehicle on the side of Bamberg Highway. Now, after receiving a search warrant, agents searched the area and the vehicle. The SLED report said, The gas tank door was open and the gas cap was hanging on the side of the vehicle. The vehicle doors were locked. The key was located in the victim's pocket, and that key was used to open up the vehicle. The vehicle was in park. The battery was functional. However, they claimed that the vehicle would not start. Now, Stephen's wallet was in the car, and it was actually on the floor between the passenger seat and the door. There's some conflicting reports, but there is a picture that physically shows the wallet had fallen in between the seats, which is odd. This is an odd fact. Now, what? I'm just wondering if he didn't take it with him because he couldn't find it. It's possible. Or maybe Because he- I, I found I when researching this, I found that detail to be very strange that if he had run out of gas, why would he leave his wallet in the car? Well, we're assuming that he ran well, I guess with the gas cap off, you would have to assume that he did run out of gas. Right. Which I think most reports are leaning towards. And it's possible that maybe he thought the wallet was with him. Maybe he thought he had it on him. I mean, everyone is Everyone has forgotten their purse or their wallet, Yeah. at least most people. I mean, there are some people that never forget, but, you know, I mean, it's possible, like you said, that maybe he maybe he couldn't find it. So he's like, well, I'll just I'll, I'll see what I can do. And keep in mind, too, and I did read some stuff on Reddit about the wallet and people like, well, he could have just used his phone to pay. This is 2015. I don't think they had yeah, Apple Pay. Exactly. Back then. It's 2015. I mean, if they did, it was not for it was not for layman people. You know what I mean? So. Okay, so going back here, now we're at 9.40 a.m., and the sled agents leave the scene of the car after doing a walkthrough with Singleton and Gerald. Allen tells Duncan and SCHP that they are not needed at the autopsy. This is according to sled and HCSO. Now, 11.29 a.m., sled agents Talon and Burke attend Stevens' autopsy at the Medical University of South Carolina, Musk, M-U-S-C. It was determined that the wound in the victim's head was not caused by a fire projectile. The pathologist stated that it appeared that the victim was struck by a vehicle, and Talon contacted Singleton to tell him SCHP would need to be contacted to investigate. At this point, they collect the gunshot residue, the GSR kit, from Musk. So 
they have to do a gunshot residue kit to see if, in fact, it was a gunshot wound, just to confirm everything. So they're at this point, they're, they're, they're trying to cover all the bases. According to the Musk autopsy report, Dr. Aaron Presnell, a pathologist, began the autopsy on Stephen. Cause of death, blunt head trauma due to motor vehicle crash. A 7.25 inch laceration on the right side of Stephen's forehead along with bruises on both sides of the forehead. Right side of the skull had multiple fractures, bruising, and contusions. His right eyebrow was cut. His right shoulder was dislocated. He had small cuts on the insides of his left arm. He had cuts and bruises on his right hand. He had cuts on his right arm, including a 6-inch irregular cut on the inside of the right arm. He had cuts on his right fingers. He had 12 3-inch aggregate of irregular to angulated abrasions on the right arm, blood in his airways. In light of historical information and the autopsy findings, it is the opinion of the pathologist that the decedent died as a result of blunt head trauma sustained in a motor vehicle crash in which the decedent was a pedestrian struck by a vehicle, Dr. Aaron Presnell wrote in the autopsy report. Okay, that's a lot to take in. So let's take a quick break and we will be right back. Okay, so Sergeant Moore received a call from Corporal David Roll of the SCHP who tells him that Hampton County Sheriff T.C. Smalls called him and told him that the autopsy showed Smith's death as a result of a hit and run. And Sergeant Moore called Sheriff Smalls to confirm this information. Moore then called Hampton County Coroner Ernie Washington and asked him if the hit and run was his ruling as well. He stated he would have to go with the doctor's ruling, Moore wrote in his report. I then reminded him that earlier that morning they were certain it was a gunshot wound and he told me that he had to go by the opinion of the doctor. Moore asked where Smith's body is. Washington tells him that it's been taken to the funeral home per the family's wishes at the time of the death notification. And Moore calls People's Road and Funeral Home and speaks with the funeral home director. He asks the funeral home director if he has the clothing Smith was wearing and is told it was in a paper bag with the body. Moore instructs him to immediately stop the preparations of the body and cover him up. He then called Dr. Presnell to try to understand her ruling Stephen's death as a hit and run. She said that it was not a gunshot wound and not bullet or, and no bullet or fragments were found during the x-ray and that it didn't look like a bullet wound in her opinion. And that since the body was found in the roadway, she could only theorize that it had to be a motor vehicle that caused the death. This is what Moore's notes said. Moore asked about other injuries on Smith and Presnell tells him only a partial dislocated right shoulder. He asked Presnell if she found any glass fragments or any other evidence of a motor vehicle and she stated no. I then asked her why she was ruling it as a motor vehicle accident and what she thought caused the head injury he wrote. She told me it was not her job to figure that out. It was mine. Well, according to Duncan's report, Stevens' family stated that he would never have been walking in the middle of a roadway and he was very skittish in general. Duncan also interviewed Stephen's partner, Mark, who told him that he spoke to Stephen on the morning of the incident and believed foul play was involved. The report does not go on any further about why Mark thought this. Stephen's sister, Stephanie, told Duncan that in the two weeks prior to his death, Stephen had become very secretive. She didn't know anyone who had any problem with Stephen. This was also confirmed by his mother, and he didn't talk about his boyfriend much. Stephen's wake is held at the People's Road and Funeral Chapel in Hampton. The family keeps his casket open so that people can see what they did to him. At this point, it appears that no one, except Dr. Presnell, thinks that this was a hit and run. Everyone seems to agree that it was a homicide, even if it wasn't a gunshot wound. On July 14th of 2015, the first of three death certificates was issued to the family. It stated the cause of death was blunt force trauma, probably pedestrian and motor vehicle accident, possibly struck by side mirror, and the manner of death was pending investigation. How injury occurred, subject was apparently hit by a motor vehicle, possibly a truck. 
Well, State Trooper Todd Proctor was the lead state police investigator on this case. He wrote a report on July 22nd of 2015 that stated in part, I went down to Musk on this date to meet with Dr. Aaron Presnell. The reason I went and spoke with her was due to a preliminary report where she stated that the victim was possibly struck by a motor vehicle mirror, which was the cause of death. Sergeant Moore had already had, from my understanding, a heated conversation with her about this issue. As soon as Dr. Presnell came in the room, she began in a negative tone stating that I did not have a meeting scheduled and that she was very busy. She stated that she could not even begin speaking with me about this case without the coroner's consent. I advised her that I had spoken with the coroner, Washington, the day before, and she basically called me a liar and said she would call him right then. When I asked if she wanted me to call from my cell phone, she backed off. I asked her why she stated that in her report, and her answer was, because he was found in the road. She had no evidence other than that for the statement being put in that report. So the only reason that she ruled it a hit and run was the fact that he was found in the road. That's basically what she was saying, right? At that point, but see, you have to also take into consideration she did observe the body. She did perform the autopsy. She did look into all the factors. Now, one of the factors I got to believe that she was faced with was where was he found in the middle of the road? So based on everything that she was seeing being found on the road, you can only deduce what possibly happened. So I, I'm not defending her in any way, shape, or form. I'm just saying that she was giving a professional opinion. That was one factor. Okay. You know, that's my opinion. And again, I'm, I'm, trust me, I am the least expert when it comes to autopsies and coroner stuff. Um, so I, I, and again, as far as the heated discussion, I'm sure that she's probably just upset by being questioned. You know what I mean? If you're a professional doing your job and you're, you're given what you think is your professional opinion in the job that you do and everyone is questioning you, I got to believe there's, you, you're going to have a little resistance. There's going to be some sort of animosity. Right. Okay. So she asked, no, but this is back to the report. She asked why we did not think it was a vehicle strike, and I explained to her that we had no evidence of this individual being struck by a vehicle. I asked her if someone with a baseball bat could do that, and she stated no. When I probed further, saying, what about someone in a moving car with a bat? She stated, well, I guess it's possible. She then asked if we found a bat as evidence. I could see that this conversation was not going to yield any positive results. As I was leaving, she stated that the report was preliminary, and it was my job to figure out what struck Stephen. Not hers. In a later report, Trooper Proctor stated that Coroner Washington did not agree with Dr. Presnell and that Stephen's death was not a hit and run. By this time, August of 2015, Dr. Presnell had been fired from Musk. Deputy Coroner Green spoke to Presnell later and she stated that she would be willing to change her report to read however he wanted it. So I, I'm not just going to gloss over that. This coroner stated she'd be willing to change her report to read however he wanted it. You you can't just change a report to state to to fit your narrative or to fit someone else's narrative. That that's illegal for one, and that goes against basically everything that doctors and and pathologists do. They're supposed to find out what the cause of death was, what the manner of death was. You can't just change it. Well, you know, that's I, like I, I'm sorry. Going back to when we covered Ellen Greenberg's case, where they ruled it a homicide, and then the coroner, I'm sorry, the medical examiner changed it to suicide just on a whim. You can't do that. Well, no, I, I get that, and I, I, I'm, I would agree with you on that. But I am also going to, and this is where. This, and there's some areas in this case where Lauren and I are not seeing eye to eye, which in some cases it does happen. It's rare, but it's happening in this case because I am guessing that her reaction was because, again, she was not happy about being questioned about her findings. And keep in mind, I got to believe that she, that they that she was probably approached numerous times by different agencies, different people, family, attorneys, uh, sheriff's office, you know, police chief, all this stuff. And I'm sure that. She was getting pressure on a lot of areas, asking this question, questioning what her findings were. And I'm assuming that she was like, where she came to this point, I don't think she was like, hey, look, I'll tell you what, you, you, what do you want to say? I'll change it. 
you know, I, I can change report. I don't feel like she, in the things that I was finding in this case, that she was leaning towards that, like, hey, I'll change it. I think it was more about, you know what? Hey, I don't work there anymore. Everybody keeps asking me these questions. I'm, everybody wants me to change it. I'll tell you what, you tell me what you wanted to say and I'll change it. I think she was more angry about the situation. But the problem is, is because that information is out there, now it also opens up the door for suspicion. And I think that that's kind of where you're leaning towards. But me, I'm thinking more of a, I get my job, I get frustrated. Hell, I was mad yesterday about something that happened that has happened to me numerous times, but I just get so mad about it. And it's quite possible that maybe there was some animosity already because, again, we're only talking a few months later and she gets fired. Right. So we don't know if – we don't know uh, – and I couldn't find anything. Were you able to find anything if this case is what got her fired or we don't no, know? No, we do not know the exact reason she was fired. So, but, I mean there could have already been some animosity between the departments at the case. So, I mean I, I agree with you. You're right. I think she can't change it. If that's the direction she was leaning, then you're, she's wrong. But in my opinion, I think that maybe maybe she was just – pissed like i'm sick of this stop cuz this you know there's a lot of, there was a lot of back and forth in this case so anyway so backing up a little bit here sled backed out of the investigation when steven's death was ruled a hit and run but there were still multiple agencies working on the case including south carolina highway patrol's multiple disciplinary accident investigation team that's mate sled Sheriff's Hampton County Coroner's Office. If they had done their job that day, I don't think that we would be here today. Former SCHP Lieutenant Tommy Moore told ABC News 4 in March of this year. Moore said that it did not appear Smith was hit by a car. His road rash was minor. His shoes, which were loosely tied, were still on his feet. And again, there was no vehicle debris. I definitely think he was murdered. He was murdered there or murdered elsewhere and dropped there, said Moore. Frustrated, Moore says he took his theories on Stephen's death to the higher-ups at the highway patrol. I felt like the brass, which would be the people running highway patrol, should have stood up to sled and said, this is not a hit and run. Y'all are asking us to investigate something that is not a hit and run. Moore then took the case to the Hampton County Sheriff's Office and line by line explained to them why this was not a hit and run and tried to hand them the file, and they would physically not take it with their hands, says Moore. Meanwhile, SCHP's mate kept working the scene, working the case, but there were limitations. We had mate come in and answer some of the questions we had, but we are not trained homicide detectives, said Moore. When Mate hit a wall and couldn't investigate any further, the case was closed. That was until another double murder occurred in June of 2021. Lauren, I actually, I need to take a quick break here real quick. But before we do, can I just kind of say something? Sure. And it has to do with all these acronyms, which are all different departments and everything that you were mentioning earlier. These protocols within law enforcement regarding what department or what office gets this, gets to do that, they can sure hinder an investigation. I mean, it's like... It's pull this, pull that. And I mean, one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing. And I think a lot of times it's like the small departments, they don't like it when the FBI steps in. The city doesn't like it when the county comes in. Right. You know, they don't, the county doesn't like it when Highway Patrol shows up. I think that's kind of an age old problem. Yes. And I think in this, in this case here, I think that really kind of hindered some of the initial investigation because this department didn't know what this was doing. Hey, well, let's give it to them. Or we got to call them back. And, of course, the mismanagement of his clothes and things like that. I mean, the, the chain of custody was just basically – it was like a mess. So yes. every, I think that, that had a lot to do with what initially caused the – basically being able to find a, a, an, an actual solution to this particular case because nobody knew what anybody was doing and didn't know who to call, what to do. And then now they're coming back after the fact, which is good. It's a great thing to relook at it. But it, obviously we're doing that. Several years later. So let's take a quick break. We'll be right back in a minute. Okay. Now we're back. So the case that really opened up a whole new can of worms in the Stephen Smith case occurred on June 7th of 2021, where Maggie Murdoch, Maggie Murdoch, 52, and her son Paul, 22, were shot and killed at their Islington home about an hour from Hilton Head Island. 
Now, Maggie and Paul were the wife and son of disgraced attorney Alex Murdoch, who would later be charged and convicted of their murder along with other crimes. Again, if you don't know who that is, you might want to move because you're in a really small town. But what do the Murdochs have to do with Stephen Smith? No connection between the Murdoch family and the death of Stephen Smith has been announced by authorities. But on June 22nd of 2021, SLED said it was opening an investigation into Smith's death based on information gathered while probing the double homicide of Maggie and Paul Murdoch. Now, SLED has not specified what this information was. I couldn't find anything. No, I don't. Nothing? I don't know either. In March of this year, 2023, a SLED spokesperson confirmed to CNN the agency was investigating Smith's death as a homicide and that there was no indication his death was a hit and run, as it was deemed in the initial initial report. That news came on the heels of an announcement by Smith's family who said it would petition a court to have his body exhumed for a private autopsy as part of an effort to re-examine his death. Stephen's family hoped a private autopsy would provide them with a new, unbiased look at his body and an accurate determination of his cause of death based on facts, according to the GoFundMe page. Eric Bland, an attorney for Smith's family, has hired two forensic pathologists, D. Michelle Dupree of Columbia, South Carolina, and Daniel Schultz of Tampa, Florida, as part of the team overseeing the exhumation and autopsy of Stephen's body. We think that he did not die on that road that fateful night, Eric Bland told reporters in a news conference. We think that there was other reasons and other causes that caused his death. Once the local coroner signs off on the request for the exhumation, which Bland says he is confident will happen, the body will then be transported to Tampa. We're going to be sure it's done correctly, Bland said, and away from prying eyes since this is so difficult for the Smith family. Bland said that finding foreign DNA on Stephen's body is not the ultimate goal. So they're just looking to go and be more thorough. They're not just going for, hey, let's go see if we can find DNA. They're trying to they're, – they're going to do a thorough examination. Right. That's what we know at this point. Well, the name, Buster Murdoch, came up in the Stephen Smith investigation as early as July 17th of 2015. And Buster Murdoch is the oldest son of Alex and Maggie Murdoch, the older brother to Paul. Now, Stephen and Buster had gone to school together, but as far as anyone knew at the time, there was no real connection between the two young men. Now, Stephen's family member told police that Randy Murdoch, the brother – of Alex Murdoch, also an attorney, was the second person to call Stephen's father after the coroner on the day of Stephen's death. Now, he said he would take Stephen's case free of charge. For what? I know. For what? A hit and run? I mean, yeah, it's, I, it's weird. It's definitely weird. Well, the family was skeptical of Randy Murdoch's offer and thought it was weird. Police quickly put Buster Murdoch on the radar as part of the reopen investigation following rumors that he killed Smith in order to hide a secret love affair between the two who were baseball teammates. One classmate allegedly told Smith's sibling he watched Buster kill Stephen with a baseball bat because he was gay. The first time Sandy Smith left the house after Stephen's death, she went to the grocery store and a bunch of people kept coming up to her saying, did you know the Murdoch's boys are behind this? and that it was Buster Murdoch and some of his friends. The Smith family didn't believe these rumors at the time. I'm just sitting here like, why? It makes no sense, Sandy Smith told Fitz News. He's never said anything about Stephen. He's never been around Stephen. So she had no idea anything. I mean, she didn't put any of that together. I'm sure she knew the Murdoch family, but she wasn't able to put Stephen and Buster together sort of in the same room other than possibly teammates on a, on a baseball team. Yeah. Well, there were at least two to three locals who went straight to authorities with their knowledge and suspicion that it was Buster Murdaugh who murdered Stephen. The theory that Buster, either alone or with others, drove past Stephen as he was walking and struck him with a baseball bat or something similar. They may have done this more than once, eventually killing him. A tip was called in on December 18th of 2015 by a man claiming that his stepson, Patrick Wilson, had named a local guy, Sean Connolly, as the one who struck and killed Stephen Smith. Wilson allegedly told his stepfather that Connolly, who 
who had a long history of traffic infractions and DUIs, was driving a vehicle that struck and killed Stephen Smith. The tipster then failed to return any calls and when finally reached stated that the reason he was passing this information on was because Randy Murdoch told him to call. Now why why would Randy Murdoch tell him to call police with that tip? That's a very good question. <clears throat> According to the New York Post, long before the media outlet Fitz News of South Carolina released some of the early files on the 2015 death of Stephen Smith and released that timeline we mentioned earlier, a tenacious amateur forensic investigator got her hands on the entire police file. Shannon Bikusen, a member of the Florida Mortuary Operations Response Team, has spent the last 11 months examining evidence reports police interviews, autopsy reports, and the South Carolina law enforcement crime scene collection involving the death of Stephen Smith. B. Cousin also runs the Confidential Conversations podcast and its Forensic Friday Spotlight. She said she learned that Stephen led something of a double life that may have put him in danger. She found evidence that some of Stephen's associates were involved in drug dealings and money laundering, but was careful to say that she did not think Stephen did any of those things. There were no drugs found in Stephen's system after his death. B. Cousin has spent the past year interviewing friends and associates of Stephen, some of whom were named in the police report, and said she is baffled by why cops apparently never bothered to talk to many of them. Once you start looking into the people he knew, you can't unsee them, she told the Post. I think Stephen was a good person with some bad people in his life. I think his knowledge of what some of them were doing was the threat, and that's why he was killed, and that's why it's being covered up. B. Cousin says she believes the truth is more complicated than current theories about the case, including the popular theory that Buster Murdaugh was involved. I'm not sure that Buster did it, or that it was a hate crime because of Stephen's sexual orientation, she told the Post. I found out that Stephen was hanging around with a lot of people who indulged in very risky behavior, including drugs and money laundering. I'm not saying Stephen did. Everyone I spoke to said he was a great kid and very bright. I'm saying he may have known too much about some bad stuff. Well, unlike B. Cusin, attorney Eric Bland does believe Stephen was the victim of a hate crime. I think he was killed by someone who didn't want it to be known that he was having a relationship with Stephen. I spoke to someone high at SLED recently, and he said that they have four or five people that they have their eye on. It was remarkable that he told me that. We here at Palmhawk Media would like to be clear that Buster Murdoch has not been formally linked to Stephen's death as of this recording. There's no evidence that has ever been presented that associated him with uh, Stephen. However, you know, plenty of internet sleuths and true crime journalists tied the mysterious death to the influential legal family. And the only thing we know for sure is that the two young men went to high school together. Is there more to that that we don't know? I'm sure there is. Is everyone just so obsessed with the Murdochs after the last couple of years that they can't let it go? I mean, the Murdoch family has been alleged to have been involved in at least three, four, five, ten, twelve 10, 12 other deaths in the community, including Stevens. Now, I made the 10, 12 up because we know Murdoch family could be tied potentially to several others. Yeah. We're not going to get into that because we're talking about Stephen tonight. But what is this new evidence about Stephen's death that was discovered during the course of the investigation into the murders of Maggie and Paul? There had to be something worth another look, right? Yeah. But we don't know what, like we said earlier, we don't know what was discovered during that investigation that had anything to do with Stephen. I think just, I, you know, when you're getting into a case and you're digging up the stuff, now keep in mind, they wanted to bring Murdoch down. I mean, he, they, they were tired of his shit. This whole community was over him. We watched the, the documentary thing that, about the, the boat accident with Mallory who was killed. There's so many people that were talking and everybody knew how dirty these people are. And I think everyone in the community, number one, was, was scared, fearful. You know what I mean? So I think there's a lot more involved. So I think there was so many ties. They were tied to so many things that when they were looking in, digging up other evidence in the murder of the Maggie and Paul, that they 
kind of found some other stuff that may have been swept under the rug here or there. So, yeah. of course, that opens their eyes like, hey, look, we have to take a look at this now. So I think that maybe that's what it is. But unfortunately, we just I just couldn't find anything. Well, on March 20th of this year, 2023, just weeks after his father was convicted of murdering his mother and brother, Buster Murdoch finally addressed the rumors about his involvement in Stephen Smith's death. His statement read, I have tried my best to ignore the vicious rumors about my involvement in Stephen Smith's tragic death that continue to be published in the media as I grieve over the brutal murders of my mother and brother. I love them so much and miss them terribly. I haven't spoken up until now because I want to live in private while I cope with their deaths and my father's incarceration. Before, during, and since my father's trial, I have been targeted and harassed by the media and followers of this story. This has gone on far too long. These baseless rumors of my involvement with Stephen and his death are false. I unequivocally deny any involvement in his death, and my heart goes out to the Smith family. I am requesting that the media immediately stop publishing these defamatory comments and rumors about me. Well, Buster, we're not accusing you of anything here at Paradise After Dark. We're just trying to put together what happened to Stephen Smith. Yeah, Buster. On March 31st of this year, authorities announced they had two persons of interest in Stephen's case, Patrick Wilson and Sean Connolly, both 25, and both of whom were originally implicated in Smith's July 2015 death. The two men were teenagers at the time and lived just a few miles from where Stephen's battered body was found. Remember, about five months after Stephen's body was found, Wilson's stepfather at the encouragement of Alex Murdaugh's older brother, tipped investigators off to the boy's involvement in the death. But we have recently learned that at the time of Wilson's confession, he was facing attempted murder charges for an incident that was not immediately clear. Those charges were dropped shortly after by a solicitor who served at the pleasure of the Murdaugh's, one Hampton historian told Fitz News. Within one year of Stephen's death, Randy Murdoch filed two motor vehicle accident lawsuits against Connolly on behalf of clients, both of which were dismissed by Murdoch-friendly judges. Things that make you go, hmm. Mm. It was confirmed by the Smith family attorney, Eric Bland, on April 3rd, 2023, which is literally just days ago that Stephen's body was exhumed and examined over the weekend of April 1st and 2nd. A tremendous amount of planning went into this past weekend by a lot of people, including the funeral home, coroner, DHEC, the excavators, Dr. Dupree, Dr. Schultz, and Haney, which I'm assuming is Heather Walsh Haney. I, I haven't heard her name yet, but I would assume because she's such a renowned forensic pathologist mm -hmm. that and and she is down here in Florida that she would have been involved so I, I presume that's who they mean when they say Haney and at least 12 sled officers bland said the biggest thanks goes to sled chief mark keel because without him this could not have gone on without a hitch attorney bland also told people on april 3rd that authorities initially believed that Stephen ran out of gas and was walking in the street when he was hit, but Eric Bland does not believe this to be true. He definitely did not run out of gas, Bland said. Nobody leaves their wallet in their car, especially if they run out of gas. And nobody starts walking miles and miles, three miles from his car, down a country road at four in the morning. Bland, who said he believes Smith was killed at another location before he was placed on the road, also confirmed that Smith had no drugs in his system at the time of his death. In the most up-to-date information we have on this case, according to People magazine, Stephen Smith's second autopsy yields new evidence declared a success. Forensic expert Dr. Kenneth Kinsey, who was hired as a private investigator by Sandy Smith's legal team, gave an autopsy update to News Nation on Tuesday, April 4th. I do know it was a success. They said they did collect evidence. It was very good documentation and everybody was upbeat about the information that was collected, Kinsey said. And that's not always the situation when you exhume someone after so many years. Kinsey went on to say that the final autopsy report was not ready yet, 
but he said, I'm very, very excited about the report coming and the pathologists were very upbeat. So that's where we are right now. Okay. That is the, the most up-to-date information that we have as of this recording. Yes. So. And now <laughs> for Ken's favorite, something good comes from something bad. I'm well, going to let you, I'm gonna let you well, take this. Well, I, I only truly like these because it, it shows growth and change for the good. So, you know, when something bad happens, you know, people make changes. And then, you know, we as a society change and everybody comes together and it's usually always a good thing. So an organization called Standing for Stephen was founded in Smith's memory. Now, Suzanne Andrews, she's an accountant from Columbia, South Carolina, founded the group Standing for Stephen in October of 2021 with the initial goal of helping Smith's family raise money for a headstone. So she's just trying to basically help him out because I guess at this point he still has no headstone. Now, up until then, the Smith family couldn't afford one. They don't have any money, so she's trying to put this together. My son will be 18 in November, and I just couldn't imagine in six years that no one had come to Stephen's mom's aid for memor memorializing her son, Andrews told People magazine, that no family, no community, no friends, no one had come to help her try to get a headstone. This is about a child that deserves to be memorialized and commemorated and a mother to have support that she hadn't had. So the group raised more than $40,000 for Stephen's headstone, which was placed on his gravesite at the vigil held in July of 2022. And for a scholarship in Stephen's name, Andrews also started a change.org petition for South Carolina to sign a hate crime bill into law. But beyond the financial impact, Andrews shared that the outpouring of support from around the world was especially meaningful to Stephen's mother, Sandy. She now has more people than she knows what to do with, Andrews said, and it's amazing to be part of that and to see it. We've got to keep the light on the story and keep the fire underneath other people to get it solved. No one's going to feel like they're being held accountable if we don't bring attention to it. Now, my hope is that she finds answers that will give her a little bit of peace. It's a good thing. Yeah, it is Look a it good up. thing. Go, uh, it's a uh, hashtag standing for Steven. Yes. Hashtag so standing for Steven. Check that out. Check it out. And uh, if <laughs> you have any information regarding the death of Stephen Smith, please contact SLED's tip line at 1-800-CALL-SLED. That's 1-800-2255-7533. So we, we kind of want to end here, but I, I, Lauren and I got into a discussion last night, and I was literally digging into everything I could consume from this case. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of the information regarding the autopsy. We can only assume what we found or what was written based on Presnell's original report of what we found as far as the wounds that were on the body, things like that. And I'm going to be honest, and Lauren disagrees, and I'm sure a lot of you are going to disagree, and if you do, please hit us up and explain to me why you disagree. The hit-and-run theory that she has is not that far-fetched, Lauren. I mean, let's just picture this. If he ran out of gas, right, and me, I carry money in my pocket, and I carry money in my wallet, but I don't always have my wallet, so therefore I would have cash. So maybe I didn't need cash. Or I didn't need my wallet to buy gas, although we have no idea if there was any money in his pockets. That we don't know. And we don't know that he even ran out of gas. We they, have his attorney saying that he didn't run out of gas. Well, presumably what I found is he they, – they tried to start it. It wouldn't start. They put it on a tow truck. They towed it there. When they got it to the impound or where it's being kept, um, somebody went and got gas, put gas in it, and the car did fire up. So based on that finding, we can only assume that he ran out of gas and he was going to get gas. So just picture this and just ride with me down this roadway. This is a, a – in the 911 call that we played earlier, you can hear the man said, it's dark. He's going to get hit. You know, he's going to get run over. It's dark. This is – we have a lot of wilderness and trees and stuff on one side. This is sort of a, a, a desolate road, if you will, because on the other side is like this massive cornfield. And it's going to be really dark. And I don't think there's a whole lot of street lights. So if you're on this road, it will be dark. So he runs out of gas. He gets out of his car. And whether he had whether he had money in his pocket or not, he didn't even have a gas can. So everybody's like, oh, well, how is he going to buy gas? Well, I don't know. He didn't have a gas can. How is he going to carry the gas? You figure it out when you get there, right? And maybe he couldn't find his wallet. Maybe he was struggling in the car like we mentioned earlier. So he gets out. He starts walking down the road. And somebody comes by. And it might have been the gentleman who they claim hit him with the car. 
So it could have been somebody, a drunk driver or some young person or could have been anybody for any reason under any circumstance that was driving down the road. Now, she did say presumably a truck, right? And the reason she said a truck got hit by the side mirror is because height-wise, you would only assume that height-wise, it, it would hit Stephen in the head correctly at speed. So this person's driving down the road. They come along. They see somebody in the road, and maybe at the last minute, they go to swerve. Now, Stephen puts his arms up and the mirror hits his arm and then hits him in the head. And keep in mind, when a mirror gets hit, it folds. Truck mirrors and side mirrors, they fold in. Now, when they fold in, there's a massive bracket that has a pointed edge on the side. So that hits Stephen in the head. So his arm gets wounded by hitting the mirror and then his head hits the side bracket piece of the mirror. That gashes his head open. He gets thrown to the ground. Now, it's not going to necessarily knock you out of your shoes. He gets thrown to the ground, and when he does, he hits the road, and that causes the aggregate of bruises and things like that and the cuts and scrapes all over his arms. And when he hits with such impact and force, it dislocates his shoulder. His shoulder gets dislocated. He's laying on the ground, and that's pretty much where he bleeds out. And obviously, they found blood in his airways because he was bleeding out probably from internal injuries. So I don't think it's so far fetched. And then, of course, when I, I I'm having a conversation with Lauren, she goes, "Well, can why wasn't there broken glass? Why wasn't there, you know, body part? Well, because it hit the mirror. The mirror folded in, so the mirror took all of the give. So therefore, you're not going to have busted glass. You're going to have a massive impact on the head. And it, why didn't he get thrown out of his shoes? His shoes were still on. Well, it's like getting punched in the face. You don't get knocked out of your shoes if you get you know knocked over. And if you look there, I, I think I did see somewhere a video or picture of his shirt that he was wearing in the pants and his shorts just had i'm sorry he had shorts on I, I believe shorts or pants i can't remember but either way he had like a little bit of blood on one little spot well because the blood and concentrated was all on the head now i'm not saying it couldn't have been somebody with a baseball bat and i'm not saying it couldn't be intentional i'm saying most of the information that i could gather as a non-professional investigator in this case leans more towards he got hit with the mirror which would explain why there's no other broken glass. There's no body parts. There's no pieces of anything laying on the ground. They did say in one report I found that they found small paint chips. But if you go lay out in your road, roadway and roll around for a minute, you're going to get paint chips on you and you're going to get some road debris on you. You know, and this keep in mind, too, this is also South Carolina. So it's presumably and you're in farm country. It's going to be a truck. Most people there drove trucks. I mean, Stephen didn't, but Stephen wasn't necessarily a farmer. But in that particular area, there's a lot of farm areas. So people drove in trucks, which would make sense as to why uh, the original investigator or the original report was written up as being hit by a truck. Here's the problem that I have with all of this, no matter what, whether it was somebody who was uh, involved in a hate crime and maybe they did hit him with a baseball bat. Maybe it was someone who you know, murdered Stephen somewhere else and dropped him in the road there. Maybe it was a DUI and they hit him. You know, the problem we have here is someone, someone has ended Stephen's life. They've, they've, they've basically murdered or hit Stephen and then they took off. And I think in the beginning, the reason why the Murdochs got in there is because having their name attached raises several eyebrows. People always thought that something was going on and it was pretty close to their compound anyway, wasn't it? was really close to their farm or something to that effect. It wasn't too far away. But again, regardless of an intentional homicide or hit and run, we got to have some closure and some justice for this family because at the end of the day, someone killed Stephen and has yet to face any consequences. Yeah. I mean, and I'm probably wrong. That's just my theory. This is kind of what I've, I've recently been doing is trying to put together my best guess at what I think. And in this case, I think that is, that's the, that's the case. I think it was an accident, but whoever hit him, Maybe got scared or ran or maybe they were drunk. Um, we've seen, I've seen numerous forensic files where people hit and run and then they finally find them out later. But I think in this situation, I'm not so certain that the initial report was wrong as to what happened to Steven. So, but either way, we have to find out who did what to this poor kid and get the family some closure. I agree. So with that. I don't agree. I don't necessarily agree with everything, but I, I agree that we need to find out what happened and somebody needs to pay for what happened. Yeah. And, and, and please, guys, if you agree with me, let me know on, on, you know, hit us up on social media. If not, if you don't agree, tell me what you what you think your theory is. I, I love hearing theories and, you know, I, I want to hear them. I'm probably wrong and that's OK, but it's my best guess. 
So is there anything else you want to add, Lauren, or is that it for tonight? That's going to be it for tonight. Okay. Again, if you'd like to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Palmahawk Media. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K Media. And like I said earlier, be sure to check out our website for the links to all of our social media, our Patreon, merch store. And there's also links to some of our really old shows. We just celebrated five years, guys. Yeah, we did. And our old stuff, it it the audio sucks, but the content was great. <laughs> you know, the content was great. So check that stuff out there, too. It's all available to you. And please make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening and rate and review. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. Fastos. Thank you, everyone, for listening. To Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark.